No, well, let's talk about Harry Gresham then, because uh, he's no longer with us. If you listen to the podcast again, you get a bonus uh, of me talking to him in 2009. Listen to how different that sound. It's weird. Uh, before I, you know, start hating people and stuff. Although there is some... <laughs> I remember, even though it's so long ago since I did this interview, I, I remember the only thing I edited out, because it was while I was at Riding's FM in Wakefield, which doesn't exist either now. He mentions Radio Leeds on it, so I edited that bit out. Because you can't mention the competition. When Chris Moyles sponsored the Featherstone Stadium, we never mentioned Chris Moyles. But Harry Gresham's died, which is very sad. Um, a, a fixture of local broadcasting in Yorkshire for donkey's years. Started on Radio Leeds. Was a pioneer of some of their rugby league coverage. Look north, of course. Do you know who produced his half past five to six o'clock rugby league roundup show when that's all we had? Go on, Martin Cal. Martin Cal never. Uh, <laughs> Not a columnist, done all right for himself. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully, it's a long time until we're saying the same thing about Mr. Kellner, But it, it's very sad because obviously, no one's had a bad word to say about him. Super League show, enjoy your rugby league and all that. Him and Scully on the sofas in the olden days. Uh, a, a titan of local broadcasting, the kind of which you don't get anymore. It was the, um, weirdly, in a Alanis Morissette not turning up for a gig because she was ill, ironic sense, the anniversary of Richard Whiteley's death this weekend as well. So two titans of, of local TV broadcasting, both with very different styles mm-hmm. and very different uh, ways of presenting things. Uh, which you don't get anymore. You don't get that same kind of... And it's not a knock on the people who, who do those programmes now. Right? Just You don't get that same longevity and... Which, which means you don't get that same association with the audience, that you're going in every night into their house and you become part of the family. I, I think he, his love of sport was indicated by whenever there was an Olympics on, Harry was always sent out to do Judah what you might call some of the lesser sports, but did them with such professionalism that you, I actually you know, found myself watching Taekwondo because Harry's commentated on it. Um, he was a, a lover of... He, he loved his cricket, he, he really did, um, but he, he absolutely was passionate about rugby league and where, wherever he could, sold the idea. To, to the extent that when Maurice Lindsay asked him to join um, to look after the... You know, the PR side, although it didn't work out because there were such diametrically opposed personalities. Um, Morris, obviously, in your face, have you done what we're doing about? Harry, a bit more laid back. Um, it's safe to say that the, the, the styles were never going to work. And I think Harry became a tiny bit disillusioned with the sport, went and worked for, was it TV South or something? He went to PBC in the South, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, after that. But... The fact that he even wanted a position within rugby league because he could see that he could do so. The video that we've all got and watched thousands of times. Was it? <laughs> of Bobby Fault? Uh, Dear me, he dealt with it well. He was perfectly professional. Um, you know, I, I happened to be there as one of the media people waiting to interview Bobby Fulton when Harry got to ask the first questions and Bobby just sat on him. What do you know? And Harry was fantastic. Absolutely, that was that was at beloved Wakefield um, after Trinity had tried to rough up the tourists, <laughs> and uh, it developed into something of a, a bloodbath. And uh, and Harry merely asked of Bobby Fulton whether he was uh, going to condemn or condone the the behaviour of his players. What do you know about rugby league? But Harry was great, um, and he, he genuinely did care about the sport. He, he loved. I, I think he was more of a York. City Knights fan than any other other club. He kept his allegiances very close. He, he lived uh, uh, in York for for, the, for a, a lot of the time that he was he was doing rugby league. Could often be seen having his little run on the on the race course, waving at, at people, and uh, just a genuinely ni- na- nice guy. And uh, so you need all the advocates you can get for for a sport like rugby league. And within the case, you know, the space of two weeks, we've lost two of them, which is a terrible shame. I think the you summed it up there, uh, perfectly professional, hmm. which it's not, not always easy, a lot It's of not that, easy though. to do when you've got people talking in your ear and you've got to remember that what you're actually saying to the camera and the script and the running order and timings. And I have to say as well that uh, he was very good to us when we launched 4020. Um, they had us in on Look North, um, on the sofa, and he was genuinely interested about 
why would you want to start a magazine? What is it trying to be? And and he, you know, when he when he wished you good luck with the venture, you knew that he really meant it. And um, yeah, d didn't know him that well, but I, as you say, not just a um, someone who will be fondly remembered in a local sense. But I think he, you know, he used to go and do grandstand as well. Perhaps over the, over the Christmas period, I think when they were uh, moving their presenters around, he. Yeah, he advocated for rugby league on a national scale. He wasn't just a, a great local broadcaster. I, there are, I, I was surprised that there wasn't more media coverage, sports media coverage of the death of Vega Twigamala because he's a player I, I distinctly remember. Obviously, coming over from playing for the All Blacks to play for the Almighty Wigan, probably one of the last we'll see of that that kind of transfer. Explosive, full of personality. I know the clips have been dragged out from the Middlesex Sevens, which are hilarious when he's pushing the Leicester player over. And I know that's... He's well, not he's a not fair pushing comparison. him over, he's taking him with. He's like, You're what are you like a me? fly? What yeah. are you trying to do to you here, Phil? Like, wonderfully talented player. Everyone who's spoken about him has said, as much as a talent he was on the field, a greater man off the field. But one of those characters who anyone who saw play, either live or, or on TV, is never going to forget. I think he um, he changed what a centre winger could look like in modern professional sport because his physique was ridiculous for playing out on the wing. Uh, you know, J John Aloma would probably would be would be the first person that had done that. But but when Tui Gamala came over, you looked at him and thought he's just too big to be playing out wide, and yet he was gra as graceful as he was powerful. Um, a wonderful exponent. And so many of the times he came up the middle of the field as well, when we can just needed that, that finishing uh, touch to a, to a glorious move. And as you say, it, a bit like, you know, Ali Lawatiti, a very gentle man, uh, a man who had a huge amount of influence in that Wigan dressing room. And clearly one of the interviews that's been played a lot is the influence he had on Jason Robinson, you know, turned him around as a, as, as a, as a personality gave him, more purpose in his life, um, a very devout man. Um, amazing to think that uh, he could absolutely injure anybody he wanted on the field, but but off it, it was the complete opposite of that. You know, he was a hugely compassionate man, did a lot of work uh, in charities in the in that, that Wigan community, played just over 100 times in the Cherry and White, scored, I think, 62 tries. And in the short time he was there, won nine trophies. And uh, a lot of that was down to him. There, there have been some really heartfelt tributes, particularly of those who played with him. I think Chris, Chris Radlinski was, was leading that as well. But um, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear, we'll hear more as, uh, as his funeral comes around. As, as indeed, uh, there was a second outpouring of love for, for Des Drummond on Monday uh, when, when he was sadly laid to rest. And again, beautifully done by the league club, as, as Johnny Whiteley was with... Um, uh, with Holt, so uh, yeah, yeah, a, a wonderful player, a, a player who, whether you supported Wigan or not, and whether they were overly dominant or not in that period, you wanted to see him play. You wanted to see him destroy somebody, and uh, yeah, as, as you say, that that abiding memory of going the length of the field at the Middlesex Sevens with a Leicester player hanging on to his forearm. And I'm not even sure he was trying to shake him off. He just went, if you want to stay there, you can, but you're coming with. Um, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. One of the best things about that Middlesex Sevens, apart from Wigan winning it, obviously, is how Sean Edwards gets annoyed with the team taking the mickey out of the, out of the other teams. He must have known what was coming up for him. Um, Inga the winger, of course, but as you say, played in the centres at Wigan because... Is <laughs> that Jason Robinson and Martin Afire, who were quite good as well on the wing? So that could play a bit. Just stop piling talent, Wigan. It's like, oh, I don't know, but uh, a player will never be forgotten, certainly. As you say, he only played 100 games, but just had such an impact. Over the last three weeks, we've lost, I would say, four legs of the game. You know, not just the very old days, German, but the immortal Johnny Raper. And, uh, you know, the great comment what uh, uh, Roy Master said about Johnny Raper, um, Sydney. Sydney Lost part of itself with the death of Johnny Raper and Johnny Whiteley yesterday. Well, he's Mr. Hull, isn't he? And uh, part of Hull died yesterday because the past of Johnny Whiteley and the New Zealand great uh, and also Filipina. But uh, it's great to be back, boys. Great to be back. I'm looking forward to these two hours. I don't know what lockdown's done to you, but you come back positive. Look, looking, forward, looking forward for these two hours, that is for sure. So, first of all, I think we should talk about Des and Olsen because you played 
with them and yeah. against them. Mm. Yeah. Um, Des was, I mean, we use the word superstar, but because of what he did on the program, superstars, <laughs> he actually took the really to a whole new audience. But was it, it just this this whole story of him getting into rugby league, mm. being on a bus, mm. going to watch his his brother, and then <laughs> ending up scoring a hat trick. Um, tell us about the real Des Drummond. Well, the uh, the Des. What uh, what I got to know, and also to not just myself, but to other players from, from Lee, Warrington, Workington, and the, the Great Britain boys and the other clubs, uh, what he played for is that um, they were different. And he knew you were different, don't worry about that, not just uh, from his pace, what he did, but also to defensive wise, because as everybody will know, if Des Drummond caught you, then you knew. But if Des Drummond missed you, somebody in the stand and about the sixth row were getting hit because that's how, <laughs> that's how bad he was at times. You know, really defensive wide, but as but as a character, he was he was great. And one thing, what he was for me, most certainly, because you know, getting selected uh, for the eighty four tour, and Desi Desi was my winger, and uh, he put me on the international map. You know, and then two tries, what I scored in, in the uh, in the Test series against the Aussies after the disaster of eighty four, where we only scored one try from there. And Desi was part of that with the the big confrontation against Eric Grove. I think bless his soul, Desi, I, w- I would imagine Desi would agree that uh, Grove he got the better of him, but. And it got growth, got the better of um, of everybody, but he certainly put me on, on the map. But from a rugby league point of view, though, he was he, he was our first superstar. There's no two ways about it. We knew a lot of program what he, he was, but he just took it to the whole new level. He took it out there uh, to the country, and what did he do? The under meters in ten point eight four, which Olymp- Olympic time. Uh, uh, Olympic record. So he could have got selected for uh, you know for the Olympics, but he turned it down. Stayed with the greatest game of all. And I think the record speaks for itself. His try scoring, his, uh, his, his appearances and his performances, his consistent performances, made him simply one of the best. And uh, when I found out, um, you know, to three weeks ago on, on the Saturday, and I gave uh, Ellery a call and, and literally, literally, we, we, we were in tears because we've lost one of our teammates, but we've lost, well, I would say, I would say one of the greats of the game. It's very, very sad for you. Also, Filipana, um, well, he was... Uh, Talking of tackling, if he hit you, Well, if he, stayed if, in. if he hit you, and, uh, and well, his backside was like a gay Valencia, to be honest with you, you know, so you had to, you had to have arms like Arnold Schwarzenegger to get anywhere near him, but, uh, you know, he, he just had the uh, the talent where he was allowed to express himself. Don't get me wrong, he, he, he didn't like uh, Balmain Tigers under Frank Stanton, because Frank tried to, to take all that away from him, but certainly in a, in a Kiwi jersey, like many of the Kiwi guys do, you know, they seem to grow another leg or seem to grow another pair of arms or this sort of thing and then Fuse has him and, uh, and he certainly showed that and from a skill uh, point of view uh, he was one of certainly one of New Zealand's best and um, did you play with him at Balmain? no I didn't play with him at Balmain because your pass no. must have just crossed he, he, uh, his pass uh, just crossed um, from there I think he was on on his way or, or maybe unless he was I think in he the, was just after you I think he was uh, do, you know, I think, uh, just, I think maybe just before me was it also I went there in 85 I don't, I don't think he was there. No, he wasn't there um, when I was there. To, to be honest with you, from there, but certainly, certainly a great for New Zealand rugby league and a very well. I saw him at the World Cup in 2017. He was in great form. He, he looked very well. He was very happy uh, in himself, and I was very sad again to uh, to, to lead of his death. And and then again, it's a bit somber, is it? But Johnny Raper, boy oh boy, I tell you what, uh, the people who uh, who have asked over the last what now 48 hours when I found out about uh, Johnny Raper's passing away and uh, just speaking to a good friend of mine yesterday, a, a massive, massive Leeds fan, as you haven't called John Penniston and what he just would tell him would just say, you look at the photograph in the League Express when you see Gazdier, you see Raper, you see Fulton, you see Churchill and when I just mentioned their names, he just said, Scott, it was just something different. When the Aussies came over here touring them days and certainly when we went to Headingley, it was just something special because these players were very, very special and Mr Raper, Certainly, will fully, fully deserve. I think he's going to have a state funeral, like Bob Fulton did as well, and, and rightly so from there. Loved a glass of champagne. Loved it all. Loved to drink. Well, as I say, he, he was a character. Mm-hmm. You know, did because I read about the story did, uh, with Stuart Raper. Did, 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 this is how popular he was, and, and the people what he knew at uh, Raper, uh, Johnny Raper was uh, Bob Hawker was the uh, was the prime minister, and Stuart Raper was contacted. I think by Cass. To get to get to get his visa, yeah. and anyway, so he said, you know, Dad, I need to get my visa within 28, 48 hours. And Johnny Rapp said, just leave it with me. He said, what do you mean? He said, just leave it with me. You'll, you'll have you'll have your visa in the next twelve hours. Uh, Chuck was that was his nickname. Uh, Chuck Rapp, straight on the phone to Bob Hawke, the Prime Minister. We 
every 12 hours he had the visa and off he went. So that's how big Johnny Raker was there and, and, and as a player and, uh, and, and, and as I say, Johnny Whiteley, well, Humberside will be in mourning because he was, he was Mr Hull and as Roy Master said about um, Johnny Raper, a part of Hull died yesterday. Would he have looked after you when you signed for Hull? Would he have come and put an arm around you? Because he, he was always there. He was always an ambassador. He always looked after people. Phil, Johnny Whiteley did that with everybody. Johnny Whiteley did that with everybody. And the advice... Well, I tell you what, if anybody... If Johnny Whiteley went to any, any, any player and he didn't want to take Johnny Whiteley's advice, well, you're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot because not only did he know the game, not only did he play the game at the highest level, not only did he coach the game at the highest level, but he won everything at the highest level as well. So even just the little things, uh, what Johnny told you, you took on board. You took on board. Whether you agreed with it or not, you took it on board because you thought, well, if this guy's giving me the respect, he's giving me some advice here, surely it's going to help me as a player, whether it's attacking-wise, whether it's defensive-wise, whether it's discipline-wise, whether it's off the field, whether you're having too many sherbets or you won't have too many sherbets, or this sort of thing. The, um, the advice what he gave you was always, always the right advice. And... Uh, I guess what I'd like to put out there to the whole fans, you know, if we're on Twitter, what I'd like there to put out to the whole fans is quite simple. And um, who has been the most important signing Hull have ever made? And I will put three out there. I'd like to put four, but they won't agree if, if I put myself <laughs> as four, to be honest with you. But I'll put three. Who is the most important signing that Hull FC have ever made? And I will put Whiteley, Norton, and Sterling. I'll tell you what, what a debate that is for the Black and White. A strange email to wake up to today, Phil, because one of the most important figures in the modern day history of rugby league, and I don't think that's hyperbole at all, has, has died in Maurice Lindsay. And, and I thought a, a divisive figure at times. I, I'm surprised there wasn't more divisive comment about him on social media today, but people have been behaving. Certainly reshaped Wigan, certainly reshaped the game as a whole as we know it. What kind of dealings did you have with him, Phil? I, I think anybody that's been involved in the sport would want to come across Morris. Um, he knew how to handle the media. He knew what the media wanted. Um, he knew a great story when he could see it. He knew how to put himself at the centre of that great story. Um, I don't think there'll have been anybody involved in the media who hasn't had a run-in with him, but it wasn't forgotten the minute you'd had it. Um, he was that type of a character. He, you know, the epitome of a benevolent dictator in many ways. Um, and there are times, I think, you know, when someone who is visionary, which is a word that's been used a lot to describe, who is clearly a leader. Um, I think the, some of his, of, of his detractors would say um, a non-delegator, um, which obviously made working for him, for some people, difficult. I saw, I saw a quote from... Harry Gration, who we all know um, wasn't at the RFL for very long under Morris, saying that when Morris went on one of his trips to Australia, nothing happened because nothing could happen because Morris was the man who was in charge of everything. So when he wasn't there, uh, it, it was very hard to, to stand in for him. He, he, he was a showman um, and he knew what sold. So I think, you know, there are there will be legendary stories told about him now. Um, certainly Dave Woods tells one of when he was a young up and coming journalist at a, a, a sports agency in Wigan. And it, his job was to uh, ring and get a story from Wigan every day. And if Morris didn't like it, he'd be on the phone the next day, making a teenage Dave Wood's life hell. And then the next minute he'd be ringing up going, Dave, Dave, I need you to do a favour. I need this story to go out. And and that's the way Morris was. He, he was fantastic at not only manipulating the media to his advantage, but knowing what they wanted. Um and he, he did used to entertain all of the sports editors, he, you know, and he did put Rugby League front and centre. And, you know, the, the legendary story of him getting Diana Ross to open the 1995 World Cup, which he was in charge of, again, against all of the advice he was given by everyone he worked with. And the Rugby League Council who said, don't do it, don't spend such a vast amount of money on something that is nothing to do with Rugby League. And of course, you know, all of the national newspapers were full of Diana Ross coming over and driving around Wembley and half singing a song and being on Concord and home before the game had, had finished. But that didn't matter because Morris knew how to uh, manipulate the media. You know, the, the Paris um, kickoff of Super League, where everybody said this will be a disaster. You know, somehow Morris, 
it, it wasn't Morris alone, but 17,000 people turned up to that game and it looked brilliant on television. And he just had the ability to do that. He wasn't afraid to be unpopular. I think, you know, a, a lot of the administrations we've seen, it's been, uh, you know, if they object to something, we need to find a compromise that brings them in. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm upsetting that person, then I can't be seen to be showing favour to that person. Mor Morris had an idea of how it should be. And he didn't care who we upset and he didn't mind going into a room and saying, call me whatever you want, but this is how it's going to be. And, and I, I, I do think that sometimes we, we do miss that. And uh, yes, I'm all for you know, consultation and, 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 you know, ha having the majority thinking the same way, but, but Morris's way was Morris's way. And he defended the sport a lot. Um, clearly he, th there is a, there is a, a tale of him uh, when rugby union went professional in 95 having a lunch, staging a lunch with all the big wigs of rugby union and coming out afterwards and saying, oh, well, there'll be a time when uh, there may only be one code of rugby, but, you know, we'll start it on our terms and uh, we'll get the ball rolling and we'll tell them exactly what's wrong with their game and we'll tell them why they should adopt the things from our game. And it, I, I don't know, he, he, he just was a forthright advocate for rugby league. Um, he had a genuine passion for it and he was one of these people that when he was in the room you knew he was the center of attention um i thought the last time i spoke to him in any great depth um i think we did a, a a long interview for the magazine which was spread over two issues and that was at a time when he he, he wasn't quite as mobile um which became an, an an issue for him for being seen in public and getting to games and all that kind of thing but even speaking to him his passion didn't leave him and, and, I, and I think, again, Brian Carney has, has said it in his tribute on, on Sky today. He, not only was he a people person, but he was a players person. He realised that whilst he had a profile as an administrator, what people really wanted to see and hear was the players. They want, you know, and it is no coincidence that we still talk about, and in, in some ways, you know, a, a, a relatively sad that it, it is Martin Afire and Ellery Hanley that people still remember. Well, that's a lot of that's down to Morris and, you know, Sean Edwards again paying fulsome tribute in the, the Daily Mirror to him today that, you know, he, he still kept in touch with him. And every time he ended a phone call, and I think he says the last time he spoke to him was about a month ago, he just told him how grateful he was for. For what he'd done for Sean and and I, I think again putting those players front and center was everything for him um I, you know clearly he was not built to play the game he, I, I gather he was a boxer in his younger days but he wasn't built to play rugby league he, he was closer to being a jockey and and clearly had a huge passion as well for horse racing um but he could never have played rugby league but I think he so admired the people that did that when he got into a position at Wigan where he could start accruing the finest talent in the world, then he was going to let them do the talking. And uh, so the, the, the evidence of that is that those players of that era still are on the tip of a lot of people's tongue. I mean, I described him on the programme a couple of years ago as Rugby League's Margaret Thatcher in terms of he would make unpopular decisions for what he thought was best for in, in our sense the game. Obviously, I never spoke to him or dealt with him, but he was a ma massive figure in the sport as a supporter because he was always doing something. And I go back to the mid-90s, and without him at the helm, would we be playing in the summer and would there be a thing called Super League? We probably would be playing in the summer because I think there was a move from a working party that had already been set up that was going to involve Jim Quinn at Old and Gary Hetherington. Um, and I think that their resolution was going to be passed. I, I don't think... Super League was contingent upon moving to summer. I think summer was happening and, and Super League said, well, actually, that would suit us because uh, we won't be in direct competition with another sport that we're putting a lot of money into at the moment. Um, but no, I, th I think the, again, it, we shouldn't forget he was a very shrewd businessman um, and he, he, some of those principles he, he brought into sport. So if you want to get something through that is contentious, then give something that's completely unpalatable and the untentious slips in underneath it. So I, I don't think we would have anybody else negotiating the deal with Rupert Murdoch and his Sky Empire would not have got the level of money that Morris did. The, the game of poker that he played, the bravado. I mean, they offered something like 70 odd million pounds to start with. And there aren't many people with the state that rugby league was in at that time, particularly financially, that would have said, don't take the first offer. 
let's go back and make a case for saying, actually, we want 87 million. And that's what he got. He got an extra, you know, 10, 11 million on the back of he knew how to negotiate. He knew when the cards were stacked in his favour and he knew when he could almost hold his uh, his other uh, half of the negotiations to ransom a little bit because they needed British Super League to undermine what was happening in Australia because that meant there was an international game. Um, he was an expansionist and clearly uh, there'll be loads of quotes of when Super League starts, we'll be playing in Barcelona and Paris and Madrid. And, uh, and But that, uh, you know, in his mind, that was what Super League meant. Um, I, I don't think there was anything uh, bravado about that other than how was it going to happen? I think that's genuinely how we saw the game. I think it was important at the time, particularly the 95 World Cup and then leading into another one in 2000. And whether that was successful or not, I think he said, you know, it's not just about having one. There's got to be, we've got to decide we're having another one on the back of it. Um, he, he was uh, chair of the International Federation because it was the RFL's turn while he was in office. And I think, again, you know, we, we look at some of the, the games at Wembley between Great Britain and Australia, Great Britain and New Zealand in, in the time that he was involved, the tour in 92, which, you know, although Gar Gary Schofield still blames him for never getting his 50th cap, he would acknowledge that that tour in 92 was the highlight of his career. That that test match in Melbourne will never be forgotten. And, and again, I just think that because he had that outlook on, if I love this game, everybody should love this game. A bit like, you know, Carsten, who, uh, who we'll be talking to. And, you know, he is an evangelist and he's come to the game knowing nothing about it. Um, and, and he's just seen it for what it is and said, well, you might have had it for 120 odd years, but there's no reason why I can't like it. And this is what I like about it. Well, I think Morris was the same. You know, if this game is so good, why can we not sell it to a, a wider, more commercial audience? And um, we love characters, don't we? And the media love characters. Don't, the media love dealing with him because you just never got a straight yes or no answer. You you, you, you know, you, you got his answer, you got his explanation, he told you where you were wrong, um, as, he, as he did me on a couple of occasions. And um, whether he was right or not, he, he felt that, you know, something that he'd seen or um, something that he hadn't been asked about. Um, he, I think he often felt that he was, a, he was a major player in history, so that when the history of the time he was there was being written, if he wasn't asked then he felt that you should have asked him. Yeah, how can you know what's happened if you don't come to me and ask me? And and in some ways that that summed him up a little bit. But uh, but he did things and it and he got the the game spoken about to a wider audience. And we haven't really got that anymore. And I mean, would it be fair to say? I mean, after the two thousand World Cup, which we all just decide now is a complete farce and disaster and whatever and whatever word you want to use that's not disaster is the wrong word but you know what i mean it, financially it, it was a disaster saved international rugby league in 2001 when the aussies weren't going to come over because they thought the eiffel tower was in london yeah and again there are some people who need on a phone that will tell the tell it the way it is tell them why they're being ridiculous to not come but also have that um almost aura about them that if you say it's all right and you're guaranteeing this and that will come. Um, so yeah, he did a massively important figure. Um, but, you know, people forget other than some of Wigan fans of a certain age that when he was invited to be this four at Wigan, um, that came and saved the club, the big four, they'd been relegated, you know, that they could not have been any lower. Um, and he went from being relegated in 1980 to building them into an absolute powerhouse by the mid to end of that decade. Um, that that is a massive feat. Um, I, I suspect there'll there'll be more tributes to come. I, I I would imagine that Ellery will say something in the next day or two. And uh, the the measure of the man is is the tributes that he gets. And uh, they will forget that Central Park had to be sold to pay for it all. And they, they, they will forget that the second spell at Wigan, um, again, hovered dangerously around relegation for a little time. And that there was a little easing of the salary cap to make sure that they didn't. And, you know, he, I, I don't think he was particularly successful at, at Preston when he went there. I, I, again, didn't follow his, his football career. But, um, you know, when they talk about administrators like Eddie Waring, like, maybe Harry Sunderland, um, you know, they will talk about Maurice Lindsay. Um, he was that bigger figure. I think he was on Backchat a few years ago, wasn't he? And, and he, you could still see that 
he always had that sparkle in his eye when you saw him on TV. And he was always someone who had something to say and you would listen to what he had to say. Even if you didn't agree with what he was saying, you listened to what he was saying. And I, think I, was, I think I was on with him that episode as well. Um, and, and again, what I really liked about him, and it's the same with people like Tony Smith and Brian McDermott, you can't say anything without being able to justify it. So if you come out with a, an opinion, however trite it may be, Morris was the kind of bloke, was, why do you say that? That, that's nonsense. Um, I'll tell you why it's nonsense. And then you tell me why you still think it was a good idea. And that kind of debate is stimulating for anyone who's involved in it. Uh, you you know that you can't just say, oh, well, we need to spend £10 million pound to do this. And you go, right, where's the £10 million pound coming from? Uh, he, he, he was very forthright in his views, but he could back them up. And uh, he challenged you to say, right, well, if you're taking a contrary position or you're coming up with a suggestion, You've got to justify how you're actually going to make that happen. So we're here to talk about local sports reporting, but before we do, uh, some very sad news broke this morning about the death of Dave Hadfield at Oak. Well, Phil, you, you knew him better than uh, I did, so you can certainly tell us more about him. I, I think we all did. Um, I've seen the word Diane used a lot. I think that's right. There's a whole generation of people that grew up reading his stuff and... Um, privileged enough to have been with him in press areas on social occasions somebody we all looked up to I think he's writing ranks with any of the great sports writers you know, Hugh McElvenny or um, John Arlott was a poet I think Dave was in a similar way for rugby league mm. but it, we, Tony and I were just fortunate enough to we also publish six of his books across a, a range of subjects clearly rugby league was one of them but uh, his love of folk music and uh, he got a bus pass at the age of 63 and did a did a tour of, of England which almost made him the Bill Bryson of Rugby League as well. I, I think there are people here who will all have great memories of him. The one that I think we'll all share is that his craftsmanship. To be near him in a press box when you're frantically making as many notes as you can and to see him with the minimum amount in a small notebook and then ring in the most beautiful copy um, to see that art at work was, was a privilege and I'm sure other people across the panel have got equally strong and fond memories of it. I, I know Tom would have been with him in, uh, in certain exciting and exotic locations as well. Yes, I once watched a game with him in Rochdale. Um, <laughs> more exotic than that. No, but yeah, you're right, Phil. I mean, everybody in rugby league has got um, a great deal of fondness for Dave. Just a smashing bloke anyway, leaving aside the writing and everything. It's just such good fun to be around. All the memories, such an, an adventure of a life that he had. Um, and basically, it, what sort of added to him was the fact that he never learned to drive, so you were having to give him lifts up and down the land all over the place. And so, consequently, you get to know somebody really well when they're literally sat next to you on long distances. I remember one time staying... Uh, we went down to Swansea. I can't remember what the international was, but it was around sort of 2,000 mark. Wasn't the World Cup though, um, and we went down to Swansea, and it somehow persuaded me to stay overnight in a pub called the King's Head in Usk because it was beautiful. He said, and it did really good beer and everything. But he could do that, you know. He, he didn't want to go straight back home, so therefore I couldn't either, even though it was my car and I was doing the driving. So he had that about him, and he's. But you didn't want to go home because he, he would just sit there and he would tell you tales from Papua New Guinea and Australia, New Zealand, Bolton, you know, <laughs> just. Just an amazing, amazing individual, and such such a talent, uh, as Phil says there. Just his writing was just something to aspire to, and I think that for all of us, certainly influenced me without a question, and I'm sure I did other people as well. And I hear, I know he did, um, because he won. All right, he'd, he'd grown up in rugby league. I mean, he, he used to like to sort of boast how he played prop for Blackpool, didn't he, at one point, um, a couple of matches. Um, and he was, he was sort of grounded in the real background of it, the northerness of it. But he always it looked further afield as well. So he could see that rugby league, all right, its heart was in the north of England, but it could go far and wide, wherever that might be. Um, one of the books that Phil's talking about is a history of university rugby league, for example. He, he always looked at the bigger picture. And the most important thing is it was so funny. It could not be helped but be funny. Just about every sentence was amusing. Uh, it's just an incredible character and I think, I know I'm going to miss him I know other people will miss him in the game and Rugby League will certainly miss him there will never be another Dave Hadfield 
Anyone else want to share their thoughts? I remember the time he told his haunts desk um, at the Independent that he was in his porch, and they thought he said Porsche. <laughs> this is Dave who couldn't drive. <laughs> Where are you? I'm just in my porch. All right, lovely car. Strange. I think he'd have been a lot more famous if he'd covered a different sport. Um, if he'd been a football or a rugby union or a cricket man, I think he'd have been a household name. Um, but unfortunately, rugby league doesn't get the attention it deserves. But um, it gets the amount of attention it gets because of people like. Dave, without people like Dave, it, it just it wouldn't feature on the um, the sporting landscape at all. And he's the best rugby league writer I've ever come across. And as everyone keeps saying, a really, really top bloke as well. Really nice guy. I think the other thing that he had as well is that he was a great rugby league writer w- talking about the game, but also he had he had the ability to relate the game to wider society. And I think if you read those up and over and the can what was in it down and down and under. You read those books, and actually, they're really interesting just from a rugby point of view, but they're a snapshot of, society, of British society and Australian society at that time, and you can get such a lot out of those books, even if you're not interested in, in rugby or sport, because you're telling about the society and how, uh, how rugby fits into that society and what it represents, and to be able to do that, you know, it's a, it's a, it takes a rare talent and a rare uh, awareness of what's going on in the rest of the world. And because of the matter, we, we were saying this before we started, almost irre- well, irreplaceable, not almost, he is irreplaceable. Yeah, he is, because the way that... Uh, I, you would have never replaced Dave Hadfield anyway. Um, the, the talent that he had um, and the way that he just made everything so humorous and relatable. But the way that, that the, the world of the media is going now, there isn't... No, no one is, is taught to be Dave Hadfield either, which really is a loss to the profession. Um, and says more about where the profession is heading than it does about Dave Hadfield as a writer. I think the other thing is the essence of today is about why you should always go to the back page first rather than the front page. That's what has been the basis of local and national sports journalism for those of us that love it. And the Rugby League World magazine as was when Dave was a columnist. You always started at the back page where his column was. It, It was glorious writing. It was perceptive um, it was different, it showed you that there was a different way of approaching the writing about sport um, and, and clearly I, I just think we're never going to replace something like that and that is something that was a staple of local journalism it came from the, the Blackpool Gazette um, and that's what we'll miss uh, as much as seeing him around ordering six pints with five minutes to go before closing time <laughs>